Okay. Well, this is the October uh, Finance Committee meeting. And Deborah, would you please call the roll? Certainly. Byram? Present. Kirkpatrick? Present. Lau? Here. Portnoff? Here. Sodi, Yearout, and Hurt are absent and excused. All right, thank you. So, um, so approval of last month's uh, minute. All approved, I guess. <laughs> Good enough. All right. Um, oh, do we have anyone in the residence forum? Is there anyone present today who would like to speak during the residence forum? No, and there are no forum speakers online, so that completes the forum. Okay, I guess it's the chair's report. Adrian, you're up. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to report. All right, well, well it's stepping right along. Okay, is Tim? Oh. I'm here. Good morning. All right. I'm, I've just had a sh short report here today. Uh, we This financial report you'll, you'll be reviewing is the third quarter um, financial results for GRF and continues to show that we have a very large surplus, which is good news on the one hand. It's always good to have a surplus because the alternative is not good. Um, but it's uh, also still an indicator that we're not fully up to speed with all of our operational uh, capabilities, facilities, amenities, and so on. Um, the pandemic still has an impact here. The, um, the good news, I guess, is that from the county's perspective is that the infections have declined. Although again, I've shared this, I think every month for months that the test data is less reliable now because most tests are not being reported to the county. People are doing a home test to determine whether or not they have COVID and that there's no requirement that you notify your health provider or the county. So the best method, uh, there's two other metrics that, they, that we pay attention to and that the county and now government pays attention to, which is the wastewater level of virus in basically the sewer system. So um, that number until about 10 days ago has been steadily declining since the peak in June. It, about two weeks ago, it started it's spiking back up again. So I'm not sure what to read of that. They have not reported any updated information for about 17 days. So I'm not sure why, that, why, the, why the state is not reporting it more frequently. They were testing three times a week, but there's been no update to the uh, state website since I think October 11th. Um, but uh, up and through that date, for the, about the two weeks before that, there was a significant spike for two measurement periods in a row. So that's a little concerning. But the hospitalization and ICU data shows that those numbers are, um, have been declining and they're kind of leveling off. They're still elevated, but they're much, much lower than they were, say, in the spring or in December of last year when it, when it was really high. So what that means for us is that um, here in Rossmore, residents still seem to be a little reluctant to gather in large groups. Um, we're not yet seeing the type or volume of activity or the attendance levels that we've seen at club events in the past prior, prior to the pandemic or at concerts and, and uh, things like that. But we have seen them increase. So for our concerts, um, we had a near sellout, I think a week ago, um, and that's probably two or three of them in a row that have been pretty well attended. Um, so I, you know, I guess that's encouraging that people are feeling more comfortable getting into rooms with large numbers of people, um, but we're still not at the full capacity. We, we don't have all of our lifeguards, we don't have all of our bus drivers, although and we don't have all of our news carriers, and those have been three of the primary de staffing deficiencies that we've had for the last two years. Although in all of those cases, I think we're just about one person away from being fully staffed. So that's a huge improvement, um, say from just three or four months ago, uh, which was, pretty dramatic. Bus drivers, we were down to three bus drivers out of out of nine. 
Um, so we're to, we're now down now down just one, and with a, I think an offer out there as well to that to an individual. So we're hoping that that will work out. So uh, the way that all plays out, as I've shared with you in the past, is that if we have unfilled positions that we've budgeted for, we're collecting a coupon for, um, but if we aren't staffing them, that falls to the bottom line as a surplus. Uh, so it's unspent money. So that's um, primarily what's driving most of the um, year-to-date surplus, about two-thirds of it. The other third is revenue. Uh, particularly for golf, but also for advertising through the Rossmore News and the buses. Um, both advertising and especially golf are, are well above budget still. Um, so that's all good news, although Mark reported at the last golf meeting that um, for September, he, they saw a slight decline compared to the previous year. Um, so, but that was also, if you remember the beginning of September, we had 100 degree heat for about a week and, and that just kills play on the golf course. It just gets too hot for people to play. So, and then we had rain right after that. And that also kills play on the golf course. So we had about a week and a half of kind of unsettled weather that, that impacted the, the numbers. Uh, but with this beautiful weather we're having right now, we can probably expect at, at least through the rest of this month that we're going to have a good October. Uh, from a revenue perspective for the golf courses. So uh, those are the primary drivers of the year-to-date surplus. Joel will go into that with, in more detail with you. And the, uh, the staffing, as I'd said, is probably the biggest driver for um, the, the bottom line surplus. And that's my report for this morning. Thank you, Tim. Any questions for Tim? Uh, Tim, I do have one question. Do we know the statistic on residents, you know, that are taking or have taken the booster shot? Um, do we have any idea? No, we don't. So the county does not break out data for Rossmore. They, they look at zip code. So we know that the, our zip code includes mostly Ross, I mean, includes all of Rossmore, but it also includes some areas to the north of us outside the gate. Mm -hmm. And, um, I haven't looked at that data in a while. Uh, I want to say that last time I looked at it, which was a couple months ago, it was something like 86, 87 percent have, ha, I'm sorry, it's not like 91 percent had been vaccinated in the zip code. You can probably assume that uh, Rossmore is higher than that um, because outside the gate will probably mirror closer to what, say, Lafayette and the rest of Walnut Creek their vaccination levels, which are down around like 85%. So for, in order to have a 91% for this zip code, uh, Rossmore is probably driving that number significantly higher than the areas outside, outside the gate. So uh, vaccination level is very high. The booster level, uh, they, the county or the state does track that data by zip code as well. And again, I haven't looked at that in a while, but the booster numbers are pretty low. Again, I would think Rossmore probably drives it up because I know the residents here are much more um, careful in, in, in ensuring that they're vaccinated and boosted uh, than the outside the gate. Um, but I don't know what it is inside Rossmore, and the county doesn't track a, track just you know inside the gate vaccinations and boosts. And, and there will be a booster workshop. Uh, uh on site, right? right? on November 1st, but it's already sold out or it's already fully booked. Yeah, they really quickly got booked, fully booked. Oh, that's good. Yeah. On a different subject, there will be a workshop tomorrow in Lafayette about talking about the regional uh, water right. concern. Can you address that? Yeah, so Rossmore is sponsoring this event. We, um, and really this is a testimony to Dwight Walker's persistence. He. Um, kind of single-handedly made this event happen. And East Bay Mud and Central Sand are um, purveyors of recycled water in this region, uh, but not to the central part of the county, which is us. La Mirinda and, and Walnut Creek are excluded from uh, access to recycled water. So uh, Dwight, um, has really pushed this. He, he was on the losing end of a recent board vote. Uh, it was eight to one, I think, in, in favor of continuing. This is a, a month or two months ago, 
in favor of continuing the water re recycling effort here, study. And, um, but last month, or a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, the board um, voted to table water recycling because we discovered in a July 2022 report prepared by Central Sand, which is the sewer company, that they had actually studied whether to bring recycled water here. And we've been in discussions with them, Jeff, for five years, and they had never mentioned this to us before. In fact, they had been pretty clear that they had no intention, near or long term, to bring recycled water south of Pleasant Hill, uh, which is the only er area that they currently serve with recycled water, and I think a little bit of uh, Pacheco and Martinez. Um, so to find this in this report that they published in July, and there, it was like in the appendix, there was this page that referenced a study bringing recycled water to Rossmore. And it, the cost was about $22 million from what I remember. And the latest estimate that we have received for our own, uh, what's well, called sat satellite water re recycling facility is about $18 million. So to, for Central Sand to invest 22 million to bring it not just to Rossmore, but to you know the park out here, which is county or city property, or the medians, or any other, um, would be a huge benefit to this com community and to the neighboring communities. So um, Dwight, when when we discovered this, Dwight wanted to hold off, and he persuaded the board to let's just postpone further work on water recycling till we find an answer to this. So he then. Um, persisted in meeting with East Bay Mud's elected representative, uh, John Coleman, who's been in that position for 20 something years, uh, who represents this area. And he also met, uh, I met with um, the president of the board of, of Central Sand, and then Dwight met with him and the general manager of Central Sand. And they, he persuaded them to put this workshop together, which is scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, it's in Lafayette at the Veterans Hall. We're sponsoring it, but we're not really running it or speaking. It's really Central Sand and East Bay Mud Show. And what we want to hear from them is whether or not there is a plan to bring recycled water here. There was a larger plan that goes back about 50 years to bring recycled water to La Marinda and perhaps to here. Um, using an abandoned oil pipeline that runs through Briones um, and then the north end of Lafayette over to Arinda along Bear Creek Road. And um, so Central San acquired the legal rights to access that pipe, uh, I think around 1970 something. And um, so they've had it for a very long time, but it's in disrepair. They've studied it. I guess they've scoped it with cameras or whatever. And um, it would, it would, it would, it's a 200 plus million dollar investment that they're not enthusiastic to spend money to do. So they've kind of dropped that one. And that's when, in that report is where we found this addendum that, that identified a separate line that could be brought here to Rossmore. So it would make a lot more sense for them to invest $20 million than for us to invest $18 million. So. Uh, so we'll see where this goes. We'll see what happens tomorrow. I, I w wouldn't hold out a lot of hope. They've been very reluctant. And as I said, we've been talking to them for five years and they never even mentioned that they were including this in a study um, until they published the report. So and this is right after I had met with the board president. So a um, little su shocking and surprising, but um, that's kind of the way Central Sand rolls. So we'll, we'll see that tomorrow. I encourage everybody to attend. You have to register in advance though. To, to attend. Uh, yeah, they do. They, they say that the deadline was the, the 19th, but they're very loose on that. I just registered a couple of days ago. Okay. So it should be fun. Yeah. All right. Question Is there any future option? Can you use the microphone for the people on Zoom? Sorry about that. Um, option of, of coming up with a proposal where we would contribute a portion of the cost? I, all of that would be on the table. Yeah. I mean, if okay. we can spend anything less than $18 million, sure. we would be pretty happy with that. Yeah. Um, and if we don't have to operate it, mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the biggest, the biggest keys things. is that yeah. they would operate it if they were bringing the water recycling to this region. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it, 
you know, I'm going to be a little elitist here, but uh, this part of the county, La Mirinda and Walnut Creek, is, is a huge property tax basis for Contra Costa County. This is the area that has the highest voting levels. It's the area that has the highest property values. And other regions of the county are served by water recycling, except not here. They serve Concord with another, there's another water recycling effort by another water district, the Central Sand, East Bay Mud serve, services this area, but not with recycled water. They only provide recycled water to Emeryville. Um, so they have no plans to bring recycled water here. And the politics of recycled water is that when you take sewer water and, and recycle it and convert it into a usable water, whether it's potable or whether it's for irrigation, the, the ownership of the water changes from the sewer district to the local water district. So it requires in pretty intense collaboration between the sewer district and the water district. Mm -hmm. And these two groups have not gotten along fabulously, <laughs> uh, from what I understand, over the years. So um, there's been a water recycling effort down at Alamo, or around, uh, no, sorry, Diablo Country Club down in Alamo for the last about 15 years, and they still do not have a shovel in the ground. And, and the, bar the biggest barrier is central sand. Um, they just have not been a, a great partner. Um, and they're, they've been trying, they're way ahead of us, trying to get their project going. And here we are coming in you know, 12 years or 10 years after the fact, after they started their effort. And uh, so it's, it's difficult to see that we could do this expeditiously in, anytime soon. So if there's a way to make this happen on a regional basis, it's worth exploring, having, pausing this, having a conversation. Let's see whether there's a there there with that. Hear what they've got to say tomorrow. That, that's good info. Thank you, Tim. Um, if no more question, and uh, Joe, you're up, financial reports. Okay, good morning. So uh, any questions on the financial status report before I go into the um, financial statements. Okay, I'm going to be sharing my screen here. Here we go. So uh, results for uh, uh, through September of 2022. So our uh, the total revenue is over a budget by 373,000, and expenses are under budget by. 525,000. So we have a uh, year-to-date surplus of just under 874K. So we'll go into a little bit more detail. So golf revenue is, uh, is over budget by uh, 398,000. Media is over budget by about 79,000. And uh, Recreation revenue is under plan, as, uh, as Tim described, uh, due to uh, activity by about uh, 159K. Expenses, um, again, the primary, um, the primary uh, category of being under plan is uh, salary and employee expense due to uh, understaffing of about 601,000. So in the category of maintenance supplies, uh, so after this report was published, we did a little bit more digging. You'll see there is a line there on the, on the uh, month uh, for fuel for vehicles, uh, a negative 15,719. That was actually a data entry error that we located. Um, so uh, a $1,300 figure was entered as $13,000 in our fleet system. So that will be corrected and that will be reflected on the October financial statement. So we're, we're over, overstated in expenses by about um, just under $12,000. So again, that will be corrected next month. And just going down to the major categories here. So we see utilities uh, for the month were, um, were over about 19,000. And on a year-to-date basis, we're over about 27. 
uh, gas and electricity still continues to be well over budget for the month at about 26K and on year-to-date -year basis uh, uh, just under 191,000. And under uh, uh, repairs, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, total equipment repairs, uh, we were, uh, as described in the letter, there are various categories of, uh, of some um, uh, significant expenditures associated with uh, computer equipment, uh, vehicle tires, and transmission replacement. So again, total expenses are still on a year-to-day basis under by 525,000, and again, are <clears throat> surplus on a year-to-date basis about 874K. So we'll go to the balance sheet. So cash is, uh, um, total cash is about just under 4.8 million, and our Liabilities uh, really haven't uh, significantly changed, the majority of which are associated with the pension liability. And then going to the trust. So uh, membership transfer fees on a year-to-date basis is uh, 4,084,000. Our total income uh, is four million six fourteen, while expenditures are two million uh, nine eighty five. So we have an ending cash balance of uh, just under seven point nine million. And then our bank loans, um, we have uh, three, and their balance as of uh, the end of September. Um, is 11,605,000 when you combine those three. And then going to MOD, so total revenue uh, for the first nine months is the 8,241,000. We have expenses at uh, just under 7.9 million, and we have a surplus of 359K. And balance sheet, again, not a whole lot of change from last month. Cash is about 536K. We have receivables of 914. Total, um, total assets uh, of uh, 1,741. Again, not much change on the liability side. And then a little deeper dive by department for MOD. We could see the management, uh, essentially all of the, uh, well, we have a, a slight deficit in alterations. Um, mutual billable is, a, uh, is really planned to be a loss, which is made up with uh, uh, four um, member records and the management fee. So, so again, uh, the total surplus for the first nine months is 359K. Any questions? Deborah, are there any question on Zoom? Yes. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, on the telephone um, situation, that's uh, has that gotten under control yet? What's going on there? Um, the telephone situation um, is under control and. Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean in terms of under control. Well, we were trying to switch to, I think, to Comcast or something because AT and T was too expensive, and then we ended up not paying some AT and T bills, and I think some I people think got I their think you're, I services think you're, cut off. I think you're referring to the mutuals that has nothing to do with GRF. Okay. Uh, but we were also trying to switch GRS telephones because they were costing a lot more than we had budgeted. Mm, no, that's not correct. We're, we are with AT&T with GRF phones and we have no plans to move because it's the most competitive rate. 
Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, I, yeah, if I may, Dojo, I do want to follow up on the same area. If I remember, we've been dealing with telephone expenses that are over budget for a couple of years. It's not a new thing. And so, like, in the past, I have heard that we have provided this issue we're trying to change. I don't know, is it between Comcast or AT&T? And now we decided on AT&T. But I still see that on our year today and um, month to month, it seems like that we're always over budget. For example, I'm looking at the GRF one. This month, we're over budget by over 7,000. Year to day, over budget for 23, over 23,000. So is that the area we will pay attention to? Or is there anything in the work to bring them all in line with our budget? I'm looking at the detail. Let me get to that. Uh, okay, I don't have page six C seven. Yeah. It seems like that we have a chronic problem with telephone expenses. Yes, yes, I see. Yeah, so I don't have the answer at this point. I would have to do some additional research. Um, it could just be uh, under budgeting. Uh, I do know that the uh, telephone expenditures that we're receiving from uh, AT&T is very competitive because we did an, a recent analysis and did compare it to uh, uh, Comcast and the AT&T charges for the lines that we have with GRF are less than Comcast. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Joel? I have a question. Joel, how many vacant positions do we have now? Company-wide? Yeah. I do not know. We, we have um, 13. We were, last month I reported 12, so yeah. it's up a little bit. Oh, we had bad. some more retirements that were unexpected and a resignation of a key employee. Do we, um, this really isn't a finance committee matter, it's more, but do we by any chance give our employees at least on an annual basis the amount of benefit dollars that they're getting, whether it be their health plan, their... Um, pension, anything like that? We did, and although I don't remember if we did it this past year, but in, in years past, we have provided an annual statement that identifies for the employee all of the various costs of, of the various benefits that they get in addition to their wage rate. Um, but I, it may have, I don't remember that we did it this year. Mm. It happens in December. Is it happening each year? Okay, right yeah. Okay, so maybe it's forthcoming yeah. soon. Yeah, one of the companies I worked for did that, found it pretty helpful with the employees understanding what their benefits were costing and passing that on, for instance, to friends and, you know, people who might be interested in jobs as well. Yeah, good idea. <clears throat> okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay. All right, so we will move on. And Mutual, and who's taking this one? Joe. So I'll do this report here. So for the Trust uh, Facility Property Maintenance, this is uh, 6D-1. Uh, we did have some expenses under public works for, for water, a little over 9,000. Uh, we have done uh, the ordering for the new shades at Creekside, this will replace the uh, louvers there. And then there was uh, a little bit of work for defensible space, fire abatement, and, and trails maintenance. 
And then moving on to machinery and equipment, we do still have two pieces of equipment outstanding for the golf operation. Those just have incredibly long lead times as, as specialty equipment right now. Um, the AV for, uh, it says dollar, but that's supposed to be the event center, uh, has been ordered. And then the light project up at Las Trompas is in the works. So those will show expenses here before the end of the year. The pool heater is a uh, last remaining item and we are looking at options for, there's two heaters out at, at dollar. We're looking at options of consolidating that to one high efficiency. Uh, so you'll see that likely uh, carry over. 6D-3, the capital projects list. There uh, was some <coughs> expenses related to the pickleball expansion, some design fees uh, progressing on that. The gateway studio renovation, uh, we just received permits finally uh, this week for that project. So those are just some design fees, water reclamation, uh, wrapping up. Uh, we're gonna be pausing that, but there is still some outstanding uh, professional services on that. The access control phase two, there's uh, a couple of different areas we're, we're doing on that. One is uh, working on the central database. So there's some consulting fees on that and then uh, fees associated with the setup uh, down at the front gate. And then the pedestrian safety projects, uh, those are uh, taking place, uh, the expenses were related to the Oakmont um, and Golden Rain Road project. Those are about the only expenses uh, from this month. If there's any questions on any of those. Question for Jeff. A uh, question on the pond liner. I'm just trying to understand why it's un in the over or under budget, is it not being done? What, what's the situation with that? So early this year, uh, Blake and his staff lowered the, the lake and did some repairs uh, with the in-house crew. Those repairs have held up uh, fairly well. So we decided to put this project on hold. Uh, so there won't be any expenditures in the current year. Uh, we'll likely do a little bit more patchwork here in the coming month. Uh, now that the irrigation season starting to wrap down, but hopefully those are things that we're able to do in-house, so that'll save uh, those resources. Okay, and so that will not then be needed in in next year's budget, or or will it? That's correct. It will not. Okay. okay. Terrific. Good work. Yes, so the uh, membership transfer fee, so we see here uh, 61, um, so we had uh, a total of, uh, looks like uh, uh, 27 uh, uh, membership transfer fees for the month of September. Year-to-date basis is, again, the $4,084,000. Uh, graph by quarter. And then we could see here the, um, uh, the graph uh, uh, compared to the uh, five-year average. Uh, certainly we took up, uh, uh, August was uh, uh, unusually high and September was unusually low. And we are we are now charging twelve thousand dollars, correct? Yes, that was effective on September first. Right. Okay. And then the last slide here is the um, is the uh, ten year forecast for the trust estate fund. Um, so twenty twenty two has been updated. Um, so again, we've, we have the beginning cash balance uh, 
well, cash balance of September 30th at just under the 7.9 million. Um, on a conservative basis, we're forecasting 716K from for the last quarter. Um, these amounts for the forecast to complete, um, we just reviewed those schedules. So 3.7 million from capital projects, 142 from machinery and equipment, and then their usual debt service. So we should end the, the year um, with uh, 4.2 million, um, and then we have our uh, reserve for the insurance deductible at uh, 2,750. And then in the 2023 column, uh, we have um, the budget at this point is um, the uh, 5,625. And then we have um, the, uh, the next item uh, that we're gonna talk about is essentially the 2023 capital budget, uh, which uh, is reflected in this column here. Uh, for long-term projects at 19, $1,997,000, facility master plan at 723, and then we created a, um, a separate line item for the GenEC replacement project at 916, and machinery and equipment at 580. So uh, if, all, if all of this was approved, uh, we would essentially have an ending fund balance uh, at, at the end of 2023 of 3.6 million uh, with an insurance deductible reserve of $3 million, leaving uh, 612 as net funds available as of the end of 2023. Any questions? No question for Joe? All right, we'll move on then. Okay, I think we will talk about the unfinished business. So, um, so I, I don't know what's the expectation of this uh, today. Are we talking about, you know, organizing a team to, to study that, or are we trying to make a recommendation to the board? Uh, what's the next step? I'm not going to clear on what's our objective on this one. Uh, I think you're talking about the earthquake. Uh, earthquake. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Do you want to uh, stop sharing the screen so we can see properly? All right. In, oh, I'm not on Zoom. Can somebody <clears throat> else share that? Yeah. Share what? That's what he uh, just. There's nothing in no, the background. Just, <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm just asking if you stop sharing the screen. Oh, Joe. sure. Yeah. Oh. Um, and so the, the issue about the earthquake um, thing is that um, Dwight asked me on behalf of the board uh, to look, to have us look into our earthquake coverage um, and to, to see whether or not the amount that we are, coverage that we have seems reasonable, the amount we're paying for it, the benefit we're getting for that. You know, how do these all fit together? And is our is the situation where we're, because we're spending a fair bit of money on earthquake coverage, um, is that really a justified amount of money? We've been doing it for quite a long time now. And the question is just basically to review it and say, does that continue to make sense where we are today? Or should we increase it or should we decrease it? What, what should we be doing? Um, and so the, the issue, so the, the sort of, to begin with, there's a, a, a question about, well, just exactly what does it mean to, you know, well, what is the appropriate amount of insurance? How would we determine that? Um, and it, so it's, it's, it's a bit of an open-ended question. And then the first part of it really is for us to come up with some criteria that say, uh, how would we, how would we, we, how would we go about judging that? How would we determine the amount of, of, of coverage is a, that would be appropriate? Um, I believe Joel, you, you have talked with our insurance folks and have some, some background on that. Is that correct? 
Yes, I do. Yeah. So, um, so just as an overview, uh, and actually I did prepare a little bit uh, schedule here I'll, I'll share. Okay, great. I'll, I'll send that to you. Okay. Um, so let's see here, as soon as it, okay. Let me make this a little bit bigger here. So just as an overview, we have, uh, we have a total of $25 million worth of earthquake uh, coverage for uh, GRF. So uh, the first layer is uh, uh, Arch and Endurance, uh, their underwriters. They have each $2.5 million. We have $2.5 million, million dollar policies uh, each with Arch and Endurance. So that makes a total of five million. And then we have an excess layer uh, for $20 million with Everest. So we have a total uh, coverage of $25 million worth of, worth of earthquake coverage. The property value of the trust assets are uh, just under $92 million. So the, and the deductible for this particular program is 5%. So, um, so again, we have a coverage of 25 million. The, the value of the property is just under 92 million, and the deductible is about four and a half million dollars. The premium for 2023 is uh, projected. We don't have the actual uh, premiums yet. We won't get those until uh, close to the end of December, but it's budgeted at $396,000. So that's, that's kind of the, the broad description or overview of our earthquake insurance program. Um, some additional information that um, I had discussions with Gallagher on is uh, they, had, uh, they had a study done uh, for, it's kind of like a actuarial study, um, very statistically based and uh, the the uh, and they did a analysis of the probability of an earthquake happening in our area or between 250 and 500 years. So that's the time frame in terms of how, wh what's the probability an earthquake would occur in our area, and they uh, compared that to uh, a wildfire risk. And the risk associated with earthquake is significantly higher than the wildfire risk. Oh, oh, and, and, Gall and Gallagher would be, uh, they went over the data with me. It's, it's uh, again, it's, it's a little complex. There's a lot of data, but um, the uh, the numbers are, are quite startling, but again, we're looking at a, a analysis between 250 and 500 years, that range, uh, but if an earthquake uh, did occur, um, you know, they're saying damages could, you know, be, you know, well in excess of $6 million versus a wildfire within that same time frame, uh, the damages, again, the, the statistical data uh, is, uh, you know, it, it was maybe a few hundred thousand dollars versus the over six million dollars for the earthquake. And again, Gallagher could, could uh, I'm sure would be happy to attend one of the finance meetings and go over the data um, themselves and explain it. Mm -hmm. So let me, uh, maybe it would be helpful to just to back up and, and explain the rationale that the board had at the time when we first acquired earthquake insurance. So in uh, 2017 is when the policy was secured. The, the thinking was that the mutuals have often been offered earthquake insurance and all of them have declined. So they've, they've been given the ability and option and can do this in any given time to acquire earthquake insurance and there is not any mutuals in Rossmore that have earthquake. So the residents have no coverage. So the thinking is that in the event of a major earthquake, um, I grew, I've, I've lived in California my whole life, 
probably a whole bunch of residents here have not experienced a major earthquake, but I lived in LA when the Solmar earthquake happened in 1971. I lived in LA when the Northridge earthquake happened in 89. I wasn't yet here in Northern California in 89 when the Loma Prieta earthquake happened, but I was watching the World Series that year and saw, <laughs> saw the shaking and then the devastation afterwards. So major earthquakes are, are significant. We have the Hayward Fault, which runs through from Berkeley down south, runs right through the football stadium at Cal. Um, that, earth, that fault is overdue for an earthquake. It's like every 200 years, and we're already at like year 300 or something like that since the last major earthquake. So it's not a question of if we're gonna have an earthquake, it's really a question of when. When is it gonna happen? And so the thinking of the board was, if you had a, if you had a Loma Prieta type earthquake, something along the magnitude of a six and above, um, these, and if it was on the Hayward Fault, we would have probably significant loss here um, in terms of property damage. Um, and if that happened, with no residents having earthquake coverage, the residents have to foot the bill 100% to, re to rebuild their units, uh, their mutuals. Um, if GRF had that kind of damage, you would add to the cost of the residents, because you'd have to assess the residents in some fashion to rebuild these facilities, or they will remain closed. The county won't even allow us to open them if they're not safe. So if you lose the, the, all these clubhouses, or most of them, what's the attraction gonna be for anybody to stay in Rossmore? And what's gonna be the attraction for anybody new to move into Rossmore? It, was, it, it could be cataclysmic. It could be, you could have a decade or longer where there's no interest in owning in Rossmore and property values plummeting with nobody interested in buying because there's no reason to move here. All the facilities are, might be closed. So that was the logic around getting this in the first place, was that um, the first thing that should be fixed because the residents aren't gonna be able to finance these amenities before their homes are repaired. So in order to ensure that, and there will be many people who will move from Rossmore after the earthquake, who will move out of Rossmore. Uh, they will move out of California. That happens after all the major earthquakes. There's a mass exodus out of California. People are frightened. And, and so if that happened, we have to make Rossmore continue to be attractive to the people who are living here, but also for the people who we need to move in here following a major earthquake. And so that was the thinking behind, well, then we need to ensure that we have adequate coverage um, to rebuild these facilities in the event of a cataclysmic event like that. Now you see that we have $91 million of property value, but we only have $25 million of coverage. Now, at the time we did this, the properties were valued at about 75 million. So the thinking was, so Gallagher did some, um, they have these models that they can run that project what the estimated damage would be for a 100 year event, a 500 year event, a 1000 year event, a 10,000 year event. And they can project it. So, a, you know, a 10,000 year event is a massive, like probably like a 9.0 or something like that, like what Anchorage suffered in 1964, which totally wiped out most of Anchorage, Alaska, um, and with the tsunami and the whole thing. So, um, they modeled a 500 year event and arriving at approximately one third. The model showed that about one third of our properties would be damaged. So um, that's how we got to $25 million of coverage. Roughly one third of 75 million is, it, well, it is um, one third. So that's what we landed on, a 500, year, from what I remember, it was a 500 year event model um, at $25 million of damage and that's the coverage that we bought. Um, I don't remember what the quotes were for higher tiers, 50 million and 75 million would have been quite a bit more expensive. Um, but we felt that a 500 year event, we're 300 years in on the Hayward Fault or thereabouts, um, it's, there's a, poss a possibility that you know, a major earthquake on that fault could cause 
that level of damage. Now, if it caused more than that level of damage, we are not covered. If it caused $40 million of damage rather than 25, we don't have coverage for that. Um, the other thing with earthquake coverage is fire. So typically when you have a, a major earthquake, fires follow. The city of San Francisco was wiped out in the last century, early in the last century when they had the great earthquake, um, was it 1906? Um, uh, the fires are what did most of the damage. When you looked at the Loma Prieta earthquake in the Marina District, it wiped out a lot of buildings down there with the fire. They collapsed, but then the fires happened after that. Now, if a earthquake causes a fire, um, the fire coverage will actually kick in. Regardless, the fire coverage kicks in. So, um, so then you have kind of perhaps even duplicate coverage, fire and earthquake coverage. Um, but if you have an earthquake and you don't have coverage and there's no fire, you have no coverage whatsoever. If you have no coverage and you have a fire and, um, sorry, if you have coverage and then you have a fire, you are covered to the limit of your, of your uh, amount, the 25 million. So now the property values have been inflated. Um, it's been five years, um, so we're at $91 million which means we're at less than 25% coverage. So whether you want to evaluate whether we should be at 25%, whether you want to evaluate or recommend whether we should have coverage at all, whether we want some other level of coverage, that those are, I think, probably the questions that Dwight wanted you to deliberate on and, and figure out. Not that you're all, and we all recognize that none of us are experts in this stuff. Um, having Gallagher maybe come here to talk about earthquake coverage might be helpful for you in a future discussion. But I wanted to give you, explain to you how and why we got the coverage, why we've, and it was not unanimous. It was a, in fact, I think it was like a five to four vote at the time. Subsequent votes, the next year, they voted again to continue, and I think it was maybe eight to one. Um, and then I don't even remember we've voted maybe after that. I think it's just been part of the program ever since. So, but there was uh, significant objections on the board at the time we got the coverage. Some board members really didn't feel like it was worth the money. But then in the next year, significantly, everybody pretty much, eight, I think it was eight to one, agreed to continue with the coverage. And then, we, as I said, we've had it ever since. So those are maybe the questions that you can chew on here today. Okay. Um, so quick question then on the $91 million, is that the buildings? I mean, we have many things. We have swimming pools, we have tennis courts. Um, it's the road. It includes yeah. the roads, the roadways also are part of that insured value. Okay. Uh, the swimming pools are part of that insured value. And then all the structures, the GRF structures. Okay but not something like the golf course, for example, or the pond. No, they, they would be covered as well, but we don't expect there to be much risk on the golf course. I mean, perhaps uh, the pond could fail. Mm. Um, I'm sure if the golf, uh, I got the listing here from Gallagher. Um, oh, okay. I, I didn't see the golf course in there. So maybe they excluded it. I remember we talked about it back at that time. So it might have been that they didn't anticipate there would be any loss in the golf course. So there was no, maybe that was the rationale if, it, if it's not included today. Okay. Yeah. I was just trying to understand what the, what items were covered. But the golf course facility, the clubhouse, the Creekside clubhouse, yes. all of that would all be covered. Right. Yep. right. I, yeah. I didn't see the roadway being covered though. Right. The, the road, the roadway should be covered. That was a specific r request of us. I'm, I don't see it on that right. thing, but I don't, I don't. You'll have to probably check on that, Joel. That was um, a major concern. In fact, that would probably be where we would suffer the most damage. Would be in roadway separations mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. But th that was and a specific issue that we talked about at the time we got the coverage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And with that cover what does the earthquake cover coverage include like if there was a landslide triggered by the earthquake and that blocked a road would that be covered 
That's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. We, we know that if it's not an earthquake, we specifically have an exclusion for earth movement. Um, but that's on our regular liability policies. But the earthquake, if there was an earth movement triggered by the earthquake, uh, that's a good question. And since we got the earthquake policy, we did have earth movement up on Mutual 61, uh, 68. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that occurred, I think, the following year, like in 2018. So, um, and that's what led to us, the insurance companies paying $6 million, I think, in claims on that earth movement. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then they discontinued coverage from that point forward. <laughs> they weren't going to suffer another one of those losses. They were only getting like $30,000 a year or something like that for mm. the insurance. So they didn't, they lost some money on that one. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. I don't know the protocol. There are a couple of questions from the audience. Do we take them? The board members can board ask members. clarifying questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So if the finance committee chooses to... I'm sorry, could you use the microphone? It helps with the recording. If the finance committee chooses to study the um, risk of earthquakes and, and what to do about it within Rossmore. I would just ask that they add the hypothetical that if the insurers pull out of California, what would we do? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I was just asking what, what was the line that says health services? That's the medical center. So that will be oh removed. across the that, street that, medical that, that will be removed when the sale is is complete. And that's quite substantial too. Yeah. All right, good. Um, so Adrian, do you have an uh, an idea how to proceed from here? Are we talking about having a motion forming a a, a study team? Well, I th I think it was very useful to understand the the logic that the board was following in 2017 when they initiated this coverage. Um, that makes certainly makes a certain, you know, great deal of sense. Um, and um, and I, that's problem, that, that logic is, uh, you know, the rationale there has probably gotten lost. Um, it, has, it needs to be restated every so often. Um, so if nothing else, we should do that. Um, but I do think it is worth reviewing what is being covered in detail. Um, and for example, so the, the medical center is going to go away, presumably in 2023. Does that mean we want to reduce the amount uh, or not? Uh, I don't know, but you know, that's a question that we would have. Um, you know, is the roadway really covered properly? What about earth movement on it? Um, so I think having Gallagher come in and do a presentation um, in a month or two would be very useful. And this is not something that we need to resolve in the next week or two, but, you know, it is something that we need to think about over some, some period of time and come up with some suggestions. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I I think that it would be very helpful to, first of all, um, bring bring these documents and thank you so much for what you've already put together for us. But to to bring them into the, the an accurate status for us, um, but then to have Gallagher come. But I I think that that should be a joint meeting of the finance committee and the board because I think the board should have an opportunity to hear hear that presentation and and question ask their questions. Um, Otherwise, you know, we do we we listen to Gallagher and we get better informed, and then we make a re recommendation. But then I'm sure the board would have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, I think so too. So, can we have a uh, do we have to vote on it, or we just put an action item there for the staff to uh, reach out and organize a joint meeting between the committee and the board? Are you thinking January? Probably better. <laughs> yeah, probably January would be mm -hmm. yeah. a good time. Okay. Yeah. I will note that. 
Yeah, I don't think we need to vote on this. It's an action item. Okay. No. Good. No. All right. So so yeah, so Joel and, and and I will work with Gallagher and try and figure out a date and and sort of focus the agenda somewhat on all this. But I think this is a, this has been a good good discussion to get us started. Yes. Thank you, Joel. All right, good. So uh, that's good. Uh, let's go on to um, new business. We're going to look at other project this year's unfinished and next year's project. Jeff, are you the one walking us through? So I think Joel and I will team up on this, but first mm -hmm. let's start with uh, the agenda item 8.8-1. And that is the capital projects for 2022-23. These are the current projects that are approved and funded. We want to start here just to note what projects will need to carry over into 2023 and what projects uh, either are not being done this year that were originally approved or will show some savings. So as we go down here, you'll see the, the gateway studios uh, that will carry into 2023 with construction. However, it will uh, all be spent. Uh, the water reclamation, we are pausing that, but there is still a, some expenses. So there may be some savings depending on what ultimately the planning committee wants to do with, with that project moving forward. Uh, access control will continue into 2023. Um, the new roof structure at Tice is a fairly big expense. We've made down payment on the uh, supplies for that, but the work likely won't happen until early 2023. And then as we go down the pickleball expansion, there'll be some expenses through this year, but the main portion of that project will continue into 2023. And then uh, towards the bottom, uh, the street construction for Skycrest and Golden Rain Road at 570,000. We paused uh, the uh, paving work for this year, so there won't be any of that expenditure in 2022. We have rebudgeted funds for 2023, so you'll see a, a savings of 570,000. The pond liner we talked about earlier, again, that won't be expended, so there'll be a savings of 125,000. Uh, we are carrying over funds for the revision of the trust uh, agreement. So in, in total, we're looking to carry over uh, a significant amount into 2023, a little over $2 million, but there is uh, about 900,000 in savings from the current year uh, budget. Is there any questions on that before we move to the next? Oh, is that all likely to be spent within 2023? Sounds like it is. Those are likely unless we hit something with one of the major projects that, that delays it, otherwise they would be. Okay. 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 So our next attachment, we blow that up there a bit. These spreadsheets get pretty small. Uh, <laughs> so for it, this one, this is the projected or the uh, recommended list of projects for 2023. The projects are based on the facilities master plan that was adopted uh, earlier this year, as well as the long range capital forecast, which is basically projects to maintain our existing infrastructure. It also includes the GenArc replacement at the very top. The total list of projects comes to uh, just over 3.6 million. And below that is the machinery and equipment. Again, this is equipment to replace existing uh, vehicles and uh, IT equipment, but also to complete some projects. Uh, there's uh, some additional equipment for golf maintenance um, and the, the IT uh, equipment. The total for the machinery and equipment right now is 580,000, giving us a total projects and machinery and equipment of 4.2 million. 
And then as we discussed from the last slide, the carryover from the existing is just over 2 million. So we're looking at a total for 2023 of uh, just over 6.3 million. If you go back to uh, your earlier review of the trust estate funds that, that Joel went through, um, these numbers are then reflected into that spreadsheet uh, to kind of show that our overall available resources does match what uh, is being projected for 2023. And I would like to remind the Finance Committee that our task here is not to be concerned about particularly about the individual projects, but basically to look at the entire dollar number and say, is this number feasible? Are we overspending? Are we underspending? Well, not so much are we underspending, but are we overspending? And uh, to recommend to the board whether or not we can afford these projects. It's not to identify which projects. So, so it's really the bottom line number here that we're concerned about. And a question for Joe or Jeff. So, so Joe, the um, 2023 cash flow already factored into this. That's or correct. Is in there. That's correct. And we did see our ending balance is will still be in in. Black. Yes, yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Is this an item we need to make any recommendation, or this is an FYI? A recommendation. recommendation. We do. Yeah. We do. Yeah. So, the uh, can I have a motion then? We would uh, like to recommend a proposed capital project to the board. And Diane? I move that we recommend this proposed budget to the board for their approval. A second? I'll second. All right. And uh, all in six, favor? Yeah. Oh, do we have any six. discussion? <laughs> Can I get a total for that, that there is a available in that motion? The total, grand total for the project, or just for 2023? For the, yeah. the capital project, six okay. million. Yeah, so it's six million three hundred Sixty-eight thousand six hundred fifty-three. Yes, thank you. All right. Any other discussions? If not, let's have Alice, a vote. Uh, Deborah, do you need like, to call uh, it out? Alice. Yes. Before you vote, um, I think it's important that Joel, if you will walk them through, to in the um, this schedule, the projection again. Yep, just to make sure that sure. we have adequate cash available. That's, that's the essence of the motion, but we should be really clear. We're talking about millions of dollars here. Thank you. Point of detail. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a little, um, can you, the, there's six million there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm having yeah, a little so bit of the, difficulty trying to figure out how yeah, that so, six million shows up here. Yeah. So in this schedule in 2022, it has uh, all of the 2022 projects. So the carryover is uh, is uh, that we identified in in the previous schedule is all in 2022. So it's included in the. Uh, the forecast to complete the 3.7 million and the and the 142 for the machinery and equipment. In the 2023 column, it includes the uh, the uh, the 4.3 million. So the combination of 2022 and 2023 is all inclusive. We right. just broke, we just broke it out uh, differently on the previous schedules. So in actual fact, we will exit 2022, not with 1.492, but with 1.492 plus 2.15 or whatever the amount that we haven't spent. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. So, so we will actually have 3.6 roughly. 
you know, 4.2. Yeah. Yeah, if one points mm -hmm. them plus three, two points. Yeah, but funds available, we will actually, because we're trying to maintain that balance of deductible reserve. But but the, uh, so if everything is approved uh, at, as of the end of 2023, the ending fund balance will be the 3.6 million. Right, but I, but I was just concerned about the cash, cash flow. Um, so in effect, we will have something like $6 million available. As of the end of 2022, based yeah. on the on the latest projection of spending right. on 2022 capital projects. Right. And the of the long range capital plan projects, those mostly are not going to get started right away. Is that correct? I mean, they'll they'll fall in place throughout the year. That's correct. We we schedule those kind of based on availability of not only resources but uh, staffing uh, to carry out those various projects. Uh, there's lead times on equipment and so forth. So these projects will definitely be spread out over the year. Right, and some of them probably won't get completed either in the year. That's correct. And, and we'll end up with some money not being spent, but we budgeted. So it, I mean, it seems to me that we're fairly safe in terms of cash. Do you agree with me, Joel? Ten? Yes, I, I would concur. And also, Joe, does that 2023 balance or 22 balance uh, factor into the savings? There are some savings. Is that about 90,000 or more than that? It's almost 900,000 in savings. 900,000. So that's almost a million dollars of the project that we will not do, and therefore it will be a saving. That's factored into this cash flow analysis. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other concerns, questions? No, just a, a, one observation. I don't know that this is accurate, but but on the um, looking at the 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 carry forward for the projects, um, there's nine hundred thousand dollars for the the studio renovations, and based on the experience with this phase that we, I think, are near completion, um, it's. It seems to me that 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 wouldn't even be fully expended in the, in the coming year, because those that project those projects seem to the studio renovations seem to take a very long time. They're beautiful, but they take a long time. So we actually were have an item on the board agenda for Thursday uh, to consider a, a construction agreement, and we just got permits, so we should be starting construction within the next uh, few months. And then that is about a, a six-month project. So we should, unless something goes uh, south, that we should be able to uh, expend those funds in 2023. Okay. Yeah, good. All right. If no other questions, we'll uh, take a vote. Deb? Certainly. Byram? Yes. Kirkpatrick? Yes. Lau? Yes. Portnoff? Yes. Sodi? Yes. Okay. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. So no other discussion. Now I want to do, confirm this. Is our next meeting really on November 29th? Yes. All right, so we're not going to have a combined November and December meeting? There is. The board meeting is on the first Thursday of the month, which is December 1st. So your meeting precedes that to give them information. So it would be on November 29th. So therefore, we don't have a December meeting? No, you do not. Okay, just want to confirm that. <laughs> it's a week right after Thanksgiving. <laughs> won't be here. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That will be a little tricky on the day. Okay, mm -hmm. so our next regular meeting will be November 29th. Thank you. And 
I think meeting is adjourned.